Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially because this place really feels like home. I think I've spoken to most of you, but I used to be an assistant scientist here years ago for six years, so I'm really happy to be back. And all of what you're saying is really ringing a bell, and I'm just really, really grateful, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. So I, you know, as I was preparing for this and not really knowing fully what you guys were working on for your projects, I'm like, what am I going to talk about? Um, I am a senior scientist, as you now know, and uh, I will tell you right now that as an NGO scientist, you learn to wear many hats. So I could have spoken of one of many things I'm no longer focused on one topic. Then it struck me that I was going to be in a room full of either oceanographers or at least folks that are keenly interested in oceanography. Otherwise, why would you have spent six weeks on a ship that's moving about? <laughs> and there is something that I've been wanting to say to the oceanographic community for a while now. And I try through blog and a paper that I'm working on, but nothing better than having a conversation. And I hope this will spark some debate. Uh, I decided to take a provocative approach since it's three, and I know you're all kind of ready to maybe not nap, but have a beer or something. <laughs> so what I've been wanting to tell the oceanographic community is that I feel like, as a community, we really have failed to make oceanography relevant to mainstream conservation, marine conservation. Now, don't be fooled by the panelists that SCA really has done a great job in assembling. These are people that obviously have spent their lives making ocean science is relevant and helping to do that. Uh, you, this is a very unique group of people. Also, don't be fooled by the great work that you've all done in the sense that you have made, you, you've spent the last two months making oceanography relevant. I'm really talking about a much wider world that's out there beyond the SCA and what you've all focused on, uh, that really oceanography, if you look at, for example, Nature Conservancy, which is where I work, it's, a, it's the biggest environmental NGO in the world. Yet, oceanography is a tiny blip on the radar screen, if even on the radar screen. And that has frustrated me to no end, having been there for seven years and having spent 15 years of my life trained as a fisheries oceanographer, and I can barely get people to really hear me out. So I'm going to try this with you guys, um, and I'm hoping that at least plant some seeds in, in helping you see how it's really, you really have a task out there now that you've been out there and you've seen how relevant oceanography is, in helping you know, marine conservationists and just the society in general see how it really is very important and integral to a lot of, of, of what we do in the world. Now let's see, I didn't ask, that's a laser. That's right. Okay. Can I turn it off? The center button. Okay. The right button. Oh, the right button, thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so before I go much further on, I'm going to tell you that basically I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I really, I usually try to really stick to time, and I was told that I should talk about 20 minutes, so I'm going to give you a really brief overview of where I see maybe the problem is lying, um, then give you a little bit of a, uh, a couple of examples from some of the work that we've been doing in the field that I'm very involved in. Uh, which I think will also help connect to some of the topics that, that have come up, even though it has nothing to do with our guests or see, but to some of the issues that you were talking about. And it'll also give you a flavor for what uh, does an NGO scientist struggle with, especially working in international geographies. And then I'm going to tell you just a little bit about an idea that I'm developing that I think is a promising direction in, in making, helping to make some progress in, in this business of making, you know, and, and when I say oceanography, really what I'm talking about is pelagic habitat, water, the ocean. Um, so these are kind of the three areas that I will hit with this presentation. Um, so what am I talking about when I say it's not relevant? I guess, you know, if you look at uh, the habitats that marine conservation focus, conservation is focused on, you really, where you're looking at, people are focusing on coral reefs, of course, they're beautiful. Things like seagrass beds, muddy bottoms, sandy bottoms. They, their attention really is always gravitates towards things that are anchored to the ground. Of course, that's what humans feel the most comfortable with. So when you look at an organization like Nature Conservancy, really a lot of our marine conservation work is focused around these habitats. But what, what is the ocean really these habitats? Is, is that really all that the ocean is? Is that really what you experience as people? Never mind being out on a ship, but even when you go out to the beach or to the coast, I mean, really what you're experiencing is this. So it always struck me like, well, wait a minute, we say that we do ocean conservation, yet 
they are really focused on the habitats that are anchored to the bottom, which is fine, but that's only a tiny part of the ocean. So I think that you know, a lot of the work that we do in marine conservation is so informed by what our experience and, and comfort level is, which is being land lovers, being on land, being on things that are stable. Water is just not something that we can really wrap our heads around. Um, so this is part of the problem is that for folks, even though we are working marine conservation, but really wrapping our head around the fact that water is a habitat in and out of itself. There are coral reefs, seagrass, uh, muddy bottom, and the geologists love all of that. But there's also water, and that is a habitat that has provided services as well. And I'll be talking a little bit about that later. So to me, this map is a case in point. I was at a meeting a few years ago where just, just around the time that Google Ocean was released, and the Google folks were there really excited, talking all about, like, we have moved away from land. We're now into the oceans. We're you know, bringing people close to understanding the oceans and mapping the oceans. And then they put up these maps, and I'm like, OK, that's really exciting. But you're basically going from mapping dirt to mapping more dirt just under the water. <laughs> And I actually asked them that. I got my courage up to get up in front of the big Google people and say, well, that's great, but you're basically visualizing more bottom. What about the water? And they kind of looked at me like, oh, you have a point. So I said, do you, so I said, you know, I was being diplomatic. I'm like, do you have plans to help people visualize what that may look like? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> I haven't heard since. Maybe I should contact them with some ideas for how to do that. But my point is, Really think about it, you know, we're all excited about the ocean, but we often talk about the bottom of the ocean, because that's what we can wrap our heads around. Um, so, and, and part of the problem is also that conservation is really very focused on biodiversity pattern. I mean, this is, after all, this is what we're all after, and, and if you look at how MPAs are designed for the most part, you know, they're all really focused on species, and yes, of course, we love species, we see them, some of them are very charismatic, others maybe less, and, and, and you know, there's been so much work to finally get people to be aware of the importance of marine species, and that's great. I think it's now time to really get more into the processes that sustain those species and design our conservation programs in ways that looks at the links between those two. And as you can imagine, and you may have gotten a hint of that through my questions at the posters, what the physical ocean is doing, what the pelagic habitat is doing, really drives a lot of biodiversity patterns. So, Looking at those relationships is really important, even if it is hard to wrap your head around exactly how to map those, where those are, what they are. Um, and I think that by doing that a little bit better, we will be getting at conservation more at a, at a scale that's appropriate. And again, in some of the poster discussions and some of the comments you made, you know, saying, okay, maybe the conservation in the air and sargasso should be bigger. You were really getting at this. You know, you really try, you were really trying to look at that continuum. So I was really happy to see that. Uh, so, so this is what I'm talking about, is are we really looking at the ocean from the right angle to enable effective conservation? Um, okay, now that I've kind of framed it, and remember, you know, we're talking about pelagic habitat, so water. I want to take you to one of the most incredible places that I have personally ever been to, and I've been to a lot of marine places, and I owe that partly up to SCA since I've sailed around and been to just really great places, but Raja Ampat, which is in Indonesia, uh, it is one of really the most incredible places in the world. And if you talk to conservationists, you know, what you will hear a lot about is, it is incredible because it has <coughs> biodiversity like you wouldn't believe. It's the center of the coral triangle. And that is all very true. What they may not tell you, but for somebody like me who goes there, it is also incredible because it is an oceanographer's dream. You have eddies everywhere, water coming up from the deep, and you really see it. You see it on the surface of the ocean. It's, it's dynamic ocean happening right there in front of your eyes. So it's a very unique corner of the world. And uh, I was lucky to go there because we have a, a few field stations in Raja Amp, but it's a very remote place. It takes, took me like a week to get there from the West Coast, so this is how remote it is. Um, and what we are doing there together with Conservation International and WWF is we've set up a system of protected areas, which is in this map here. You can see the different protected areas. Uh, and we uh, zone those protected areas to help inform what uses should happen where. 
Now, one of the things that I was really working hard with the team there to try and set in place, and we still have not succeeded, unfortunately, is, okay, so we, we, we set these MPAs in these places because of the biodiversity at those specific places. But because of the incredible oceanography, those places are connected by currents and they have upwelling and eddies that are really impacting not only why the biodiversity is there, but also how people, their livelihood base. You know, they find fish one season, but not the next. Uh, they, they, you know, and El Nino comes and things change completely. All of that is connected to how pelagic habitat moves around in Raja Ampa. Yet we struggle to incorporate that in our uh, zoning design because we didn't have the technology to go out there and measure the things that we needed to measure at the time scale and budget that we had. So that is, there's a place where as oceanographers, we're busy designing fancy programs, going out on fancy ships to collect the information. Yet, there are places that actually need what I call gorilla oceanography. Uh, and I think, actually, I talked to Eric maybe like years ago about this. I don't remember. But I remember thinking, Eric will have a solution of something that costs only $1,000 and I can deploy in <laughs> two days and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I didn't get too far. Partly also because TNT didn't really prioritize nature conservancy. didn't prioritize thinking through how we could do that. We had to move on to the next thing, pelagic habitat. Yeah, water is important, but that's vague. What are you talking about? Next. So anyway, so that's an example. Um, and you know, we did spend a lot of time in Raja Ampa collecting information at all different levels, you know, diving, counting, but also one of the big ways that we collect information in places is through stakeholder meetings, you know, talking to villagers, talking to, to folks that really know the ocean and understanding, you know, can you tell me about this area? And that was one way that we actually to manage to map some oceanography. This is, this is one of the, the data, some of the data that we collected through some of these meetings. So here you see, okay, there are eddies here, upwelling is happening here, but this just wasn't enough to really have it be part of our zoning design. Um, now let's go to another place that, that I've worked in, which is St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean. This is, this is another, uh, obviously, completely different location from uh, Raja Ampat, but similar problem. Uh, we were asked by the government to zone to help build a marine spatial plan for the waters around this tiny island nation in the Eastern Caribbean. And you know, as we often do when we go in these places just like Raja Ampat, there's not a whole lot of information available for the places. There, there are not monitoring programs with history, time series of data. So we had to go in and really do what I call, what we call rapid assessment. Okay, how do we collect a whole bunch of information rapidly that will help us inform you know, a government that is getting ready to decide how to divvy up uses around these two islands. So, you know, we, we knew how to deal with the bottom. We had partners that helped <coughs> us. We worked with uh, Nova, Southeast, Nova Southeastern University and we basically, what you see here is a map of benthic habitat around St. Kitts and Nevis with all different habitat types mapped. This was basically a combination of uh, video uh, drop cams all around the island and then combination of that with satellite imagery. And we were able to pull out pretty quickly, you know, a, a, a documentation of what bottom habitat looked like around St. Kitts and Nevis. We then went on and, and uh, did fisher surveys with another great partners of our Ecotrust on the West Coast and uh, interviewed a, a lot of different, all the fishers, you know, in St. Kitts and Nevis. We were able to map 10 different fisheries uh, spatially around the two islands. And this is an example of, this is, I think it's the coastal demersal uh, trap fishery with the red areas being areas of high uh, concentration of fishers or high, high value fishing grounds and the blue being lesser value. But my point is, we worked hard to try and map all these different uh, features to help inform this marine spatial plan. And as we were doing that, we were having meeting with stakeholders, much about how you were talking in your presentations earlier, trying to get folks to agree on, okay, you do this in this place, we do this. You know, how do we, how do we have this conversation and how do we really share the open space in a way that's going to minimize conflict? And this is another place where, unfortunately, we did not have a way. We did not have a way to collect information on what was happening, what was happening in the pelagic habitat, where where were major currents, 
Where were the upwelling zones? Where were the eddies? We did not have that information, of course, in Kits and Nevis. And we had no way of rapidly collecting it uh, to help inform this process. So we actually succeeded in, in coming up with a, with, a, with a zoning plan. This is a, a zoning plan with the stakeholders that basically said, okay, the green are <coughs> conservation areas, the blue are fishery areas, the brown are multi-use areas. So we were able to do that. But if you look at this map, you can't really see it, I'm sure, but this is basically the 30 meter bathymetry line. And fishers obviously go beyond the 30 meter bathymetry line. And they looked at us and they're like, wait a minute, what happens over here? What happens over here? What happens down here? And we were like, well, sorry, we, we were not able to collect information for the pelagic habitat. We needed that information because we were not just using use information, we also needed habitat information to see how the two overlaid. And here was a place where we, we disappointed the fishers because they had worked with us to develop these fishery maps, yet we were not able to include in the process because we didn't have uh, the, the resources, but also the right partnerships to really come up with a rapid way to assess pelagic habitat around uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, so let's, let's step back from these specific places that I've taken you, I've given you really a, a really quick flavor of these places, and let's kind of go back to just the larger problem. You know, how, how do we make oceanography, how do we make I shouldn't say oceanography, pelagic habitat. How do we make water more relevant to, to the people that, that to people and human well-being and, and really to marine conservation? Um, and one of the things that I've kind of been turning around and some of you have talked to about this idea is it's not really rocket science, and, uh, but it's, it's something that I've gotten some funding to now spearhead you know, a, a program at the Nature Conservancy about is the fact that you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you have, you're lucky you had Tundi uh, work with you a little bit. You know, so the, the concept of ecosystem service is not new to you. So uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which of course Tundi was very involved in, was really made this, popularized this concept, the fact that there are benefits that come from, from the ecosystems and we can quantify what those benefits are and give it, you know, in, in a lot of cases, give it monetary value. Not that I think that everything should have a monetary value, but I can say that that really works. I mean, having been now, you know, doing conservation for about 10 years, when the rubber, you know, hits the road, really, unfortunately, it does all go back a lot of times to dollars. So our ability to quantify that, uh, to show people what that amounts to is, is really helpful. Now, in this ecosystem services conversation, for, for the ocean, you do hear quite a bit about uh, what are the ecosystem services of a coral reef, of course. What are the ecosystem services of seagrass, of mangrove forests? There's quite a bit on this, and actually Nature Conservancy is embarking on a big program called Mapping Ocean Wealth, where we want to help uh, quantify, map, and help visualize what is the wealth that oceans can give, can provide and have that information inform decision making and, and build tools to help inform decision making. <clears throat> but what I noticed early on was that in those conversations there was no discussion of this. So I said to my colleagues, well, wait a minute, mapping ocean wealth, well, it's great, you're gonna be mapping all these great things and thinking about the services, but water is ocean, it's actually the biggest part of the ocean, so shouldn't we be thinking about that? And I, I, you know, I, I did make a little bit of progress there. People still looked at me like, I think, I think one of my problems, and I think you guys can relate, is that having spent so many years on the SCA ships, I have a picture of water. I feel water. Water moves my, you know, curiosity, passion. I really, I get water. But I think for folks who haven't done that, water is just a big blob that's out there. And like, yeah, that's water, but so what? So I think that if we try and connect pelagic habitat, to the services that, that it can provide, we may be able to make some headway in having people realize that it is water adds value in and of itself. So, but the challenge with that is that first, and these are kind of three questions that I'm gonna set out, hopefully with a group of experts to try and answer. How do we define pelagic habitat? You know, it's fairly easy to map now reefs globally. You've probably seen there are, you know, efforts out there that have created global maps of where the coral reefs are, where the mangroves are. But in terms of pelagic habitat, how do you define it? And I think somebody was 
I mean, to some degree, Sylvia's comment about the different layers of density, and somebody else was talking about currents. You know, there's been some mention of that here. You know, pelagic habitat isn't just water and all of the ocean. Pelagic habitat is really these units of habitats that are defined by the currents, by the density differences. But how do you how do you really how do you define that? And can you really map that? And can you map that globally? Uh, can you map that for a place? So this is something that obviously needs to be kind of worked out a little bit further than just an idea. Um, but also, what are the services it provides? <coughs> Some of them are really obvious, I think. I mean, food provision, you know, fish, obviously that's a service of pelagic habitat, but there are others. So and how do we, how do we uh, first of all, make a very comprehensive list, but also how do we communicate that in a way that people can wrap their head around it? Uh, and then lastly, you know, how do we quantify and map those services? Can we really make a global map of pelagic ecosystem services? Can we quantify that? Can we say, okay, given this pelagic habitat, this is how much service or dollar return, the economists in the room like Caleb know better how to speak about that, but my point is, can we really take it from a concept all the way to a quantification of, of, of return? Um, so, you know, these are some important questions that will need to be answered to really push the concept a little further about, you know, that pelagic habitat in itself, itself can provide services. Um, so, you know, we will be addressing these questions, hopefully with a strong group of experts, but then the plan is also to then go to specific places, and right now there are the two candidates are Lesser Sunda in Indonesia and Seychelles, this is just this body of water here, to, to test some of those ideas. Um, and one thing that I, I forgot to mention is, you know, what would be the application of this? You know, why would you want to map pelagic ecosystem services other than increase awareness? What are some practical applications? Well, Marine spatial planning is one application. You know, the idea that you, when you go to areas like Lesser Sunda, it's, it's not by chance that these two geographies are the candidates for this, is these are areas very dynamically from an oceanographic point of view with all kinds of uh, fisheries resources, cetaceans that yield tourism returns, shipping. You know, all of these areas have important oceanographic processes happening. They're delivering services, so when you build the marine spatial plan, you hopefully find a way to incorporate that in how you decide to zone those areas. Same with the Seychelles, because of the tuna industry, the pelagic services here are really important. Now, now that I've said all that, you know, I, I kind of just want to leave you with the, the thought that, for me, when I do this work, you know, sure, I've been at SCA and the ocean moves my curiosity, inspires me, I'm really passionate about it, but the reason why I then went into fisheries and then eventually into conservation is because I really, at the end of the day, why am I doing all this? You know, the knowledge, the science is really important, but at the end of the day, for me, who am I doing this for? I'm doing it for the people that are using the ocean. And I always ask myself, what is their experience of the ocean? Do they see the really beautiful coral reefs or the incredible communities around seagrass? Or what is their experience of their ocean? And, and for me, it always goes back, their experience of their ocean is pelagic habitat, it's water. This is what they see. So how can we make that water more relevant to their lives, to what, to what they do daily, uh, and I think that, you know, for those of you that have been lucky to, to see that, to really see pelagic habitat, you know, is you now have a tall order. You know, your order is to go out into the world and inspire others and help them, and help them connect what you've seen out on the wonderful uh, vessels that you've been on, the vessel that you've been on, to back to everybody's daily life. Because, you know, one point that I did not make that I want to point out is, you know, when I say pelagic habitat, High seas is the place where we've been the most successful at, at making it relevant. But pelagic habitat is even just right offshore a reef, which is really close to the coast. So this is where I need your help. I think in the high seas, people, that's, people are more aware of that. But pelagic habitat is right outside, you know, like, you know, really even 200 meters from the coast. It's, there is water there too, and that is relevant to people's livelihoods and, and just life. So. I hope you guys will take on that challenge and become ambassadors for pelagic habitat in the oceans. And I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yes. So if you think water isn't all that important,
important, just drain it away. And what have you got? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's one way to right. account for what it's worth. Yeah. I mean, if you'd like to breathe, yeah. you won't take the uh, juicy part of the ocean for granted. Right. Because it's home for what delivers most of the oxygen to the atmosphere. It's uh, trees, of course, but it's mostly the ocean. Yeah. The guys and the little creatures in the ocean. Yeah. So it's a good question for all of these, all of you to ask. Yeah. And thank you for provoking it. That is, why should you care about the ocean? The ocean is, after all, the water filled with light. Right. And I'd love to hear the reaction yeah. from the those of you who've been splashing around in it now for some time. <laughs> you know, what, if somebody came and asked you, I've been asked this from time to time, why should I care about the ocean? Uh, famously, it was, it was a reporter in Australia who said, I don't, I, have, I don't eat fish, I don't like to swim, I get seasick, people don't drink salt water, so if the ocean dried up tomorrow, what difference would it make to me? Huh. Yeah. So, okay, dry up the ocean. <laughs> and then look at Mars. <laughs> I know, actually, that's a, that, I love that line, so I'll have to use that. That's a really good visual, because really, that, exactly, like, okay, you don't think it's important, well, dry it up, take it all away. I think, and actually, you, you've been a big part of that movement. You know, it's interesting to me, because I feel like, in some ways, the first battle was to get people to care about the ocean, and one of the ways to do that has been care about the creatures that live in the ocean. They're wonderful, they're beautiful, they're charismatic. In some ways, this is maybe the next, the next step. It's like, okay, but those creatures live in a body of water. And I think the hard thing is, which is the question I get a lot, is like, okay, but what are you going to do? Protect the water that moves? Like, what action are you suggesting here? I think that's the hard thing, that it's linking to, to a practical, you know, with a coral reef, the action is protect the reef. Water, water moves. I would just say in the Sargasso Sea, we've been trying to value the ocean water, but the information is just not there. Uh, we were working with Lyndon Pendleton from Duke, and uh, what they were able to quantify were how many people watched whales, how many people watched sea turtles, how many people ate fish, all these very tangible, direct values, and we're still not at the point of being able to value the ecosystem services and life processes, support the services. life support services. Mm -hmm. that you say, oh, oxygen, that's too abstract. Mm -hmm. um, so anything you can do to sort of help encourage this yeah. sort of approach to ocean conservation, we still don't have it down pat in the high seas. Yeah. We need your help too. But at least you're a step closer to realizing that that's important to do. We've made people appreciate that it's important, but in terms of being able to do it or right. even explain it very well, we're still not there. Yeah. Is the water stupid? <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've learned a lot about the last few years is the the, uh, the ocean conveyor, and that how important just the water itself to get the animals is in, in evening out the, the uh, climate and bringing the cold mm -hmm. down and the warm up and to educate more people about that so they understand how important the ocean is to keeping our planet habitable. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Sorry, uh, before time, just one last question. Then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it seems to me that a lot of these uh, conservation efforts towards their target market is industries, maybe like tourism industry. Or, um, I was just wondering what the relative success of doing that versus directly going for, let's say, like a human health campaign, like this affects you directly. Or, so can you, has a survey been done on any, like, <coughs> the most efficient target market for this type of information? You know, I... I would imagine so, but I'm not aware of results of that. That's a very good question, though. Like, why, you know, who do we target? Like, I, I would suspect our marketing department has done some work on that. That's a very good good question. Is, but you're right. We target, although, you know, for example, for coral reefs, we are starting to target, like, now it's like coral reefs, medicine, so there's some movement there. But traditionally, it has been more the industry. And, and again, that's because all the dollar, like, the relationship to the dollars is more obvious there. That's part of the problem. He said no more questions. Uh, I was going to make a follow-up comment on that. This, oh. this health connection for conservation is so critical. You did a great job bringing it up in the shipping, making it relevant to a lot more people outside this room. Just one small 
small story when I was working in the Marshall Islands. For a long time, people were very concerned about solid waste for the coral reefs. And so you had pictures and clean up the reef day and all these things to convince people they had to save their reefs. And the EPA there was all excited about it and spent 20 years trying to fix the problem. And of course, never fixed the problem because all the solid waste kept coming. And then finally, a report came out that the solid waste dumps were um, causing greater amounts of diarrhea and illnesses in the communities right around them. And the Ministry of Health picked it up. And within two years, there had been a huge funded projects to clean up the solid waste. And it's not all solved, yet. there's still lots of problems, but this idea of connecting health and yeah. the people issues for the purposes of conservation is, is huge and has proven in a lot of places. Yeah, so when we get to this, what are the services it provides, you know, like this is the place where some of those connections. Okay. Thank you.